Barely. <laughs> you got that. All right. So last Sunday, my wife, Monica, set a record for living in a married relationship with me. 34 years. Condolences can be sent to our home address. But to give you an insight into how that feat might be accomplished, last night when I was helping meal prep for our traditional Friday evening family dinner of haystacks, I was cutting the tomatoes and not paying much attention. Now, Devon, this is not as glamorous as putting a screw through your thumb. I only took off about a millimeter of the thumb tip and a, about a centimeter patch uh, on, on the very top. I didn't like the experience very much, and my wife decided to finish the meal prep, not wanting extra protein in the food. So this morning, she gets up early and starts cutting up uh, some melons and fruit for youth breakfast, and the sticky buns are already in the oven, and I get out of bed, and I walk in there, and I say, can I help? What can I do? Now, Monica is handling the knife very well, cutting away, and she just darts her eyes just so ever so slightly, just a just one of those little ink to my thumb and says, evidently not much. <laughs> that gives you an idea of how she does it, yes. Back on the 2012 wagon trip, we were going from Susanville into Lassen National Park. It was Brandon's uh, eighth grade wagon trip year. We were in the middle of a beautiful meadow um, setting up. We're getting ready for heading off. Now, most people understand, Brandon was actually up on a horse that time, a horse named Amanda. How do you get a horse to move forward? Giddy up. I see you doing this with your, you put, tap it with... With your feet, you kick it, kick it, right? Or you nudge it in the feet and it goes forward, right? How do you get a horse to stop? You pull back. Now, a well-trained horse can actually move in four directions. They can move sideways, left or right. They go forward, and they go back. So in order to get a horse into reverse, once the horse is stopped, you continue pulling on the reins, and they go backwards. Brandon setting up on this horse, waiting for the wagon trip to begin. And of course, this event, the wagon trip beginning, can, for some strange reason, take a significant amount of time. And a horse that has a person atop is always ready to go, and Amanda was one of those horses. She was just wanting to chomp and go. She's ready to move out. And so he's having, you know pull her back and, you know, just, hey, whoa, stop, whoa. And all of a sudden, Brandon pulls her back but doesn't release the reins and shifts Amanda into reverse. Dave is sitting up on the high wagon seat. He's looking down at this and says, Brandon, drop the reins. Brandon, drop the reins. Monty is on another wagon seat saying, Brandon, drop the reins. Brandon, drop the reins. I am on the other side of a wagon, so I'm not seeing this take place. And I'm probably from the stage to the back doors over here, away from where Brandon and the rodeo is about to take place. And so I hear this rodeo starting, and I, I kind of peek around the wagon, and I see Amanda's backing up, and there's, she's going to run into something. Now, a well-trained horse trusts the person on top, and if someone's telling me to go back, they're saying that person knows what they're doing. However, if a well-trained horse backs into something they're not expecting, that's when the rodeo begins. So I used my outside voice. Just a moment.
didn't want to do that in the mic. I'm sure you'll appreciate why. And Brandon instantly drops the reins. When Dave and Monty and I were talking and laughing about this, chuckling wholeheartedly, uh, we were trying to figure out why he didn't pay attention to Dave, who's 20 feet from him, or Monty, who's another 20 feet from him. It's because Brandon was never used to having David yell at him. That's not something David does in the classroom. He was never used to having Monty yell at him in an emergency situation. Now, (sighs) my children would often find themselves in precarious, dangerous situations. And the, what are you doing, was a common phrase that would venture around our house, even from the saintly Monica. And we figured that Brandon had been used, because we take the kids out shooting, right? And when you're out shooting, safety is of utmost importance, and they learn, if I say stop, it's stop, right? And we figured that the reason Brandon paid attention to my voice is because he was used to hearing it in that way. Now, I tell you all of that to say that may we hear the voice of God speaking today. Father, we want to thank you for your incredible love, and we ask that you lead us and guide us as we move into searching the life of Paul. Now, you can see here, we're looking at Paul from 250 miles up. The faith of certainty or the face of certainty, which is it? Or is it both? When I was a child, I grew up with a lisp. Does anyone else find it awkwardly cruel that the word lisp has the letter S in it? I'm just saying, shouldn't it be spelled L-I-T-H-P? Lisp, right? It's much more appropriate to have that. So when I was growing up, it was either ambleanth or ambulance. It was cigarettes or cigarettes. It was sneeze or sneeze. Bless my brothers who picked on me. That's a nice way of putting it, right? Um, They teased me so relentlessly about my lisp, I corrected my own lisp because I didn't like them making fun of me. So good for them. Thank you very much, Gary and Donnie. Not so much for the fat lips and other bruises I took. Um, Just a quick question for you. uh, And I think, Rich, you'll appreciate this with what you just passed out. Um, If you were to go to a Christian dating site for people with lisps, what would it be called? Facebook. I mean, right? Right? Believe it or not, how we say things actually mattered. And Paul was an incredibly intelligent individual, a brilliant individual. And Paul is very intentional in the words he uses. And today we're going to take a look at Paul. So here we go. Now it should be working. How come it's not working? Kason, is that me or is that you? This is me now, right? Yes, this is me. Okay, there we go. There we go. So this is the world of Paul from 250 miles above the earth. No clouds, sorry. You can see Jerusalem down in the bottom right corner. Turkey, which is where Tarsus, where he was born. You can see where Rome is. Paul traveled this entire area very extensively. And part of the last half of the book of Acts is actually dealing with the life of Paul. So we're going to take a look at this. So the book of Acts can divide it into three basic sections. First, the church established, Acts, is, Acts 1 to 7. Two, the church enlarged during verse, chapters 8 to 12. And then finally, 
the church expanded in chapters 13 to 29. I said verses, sorry, chapters 1 to 7. The central verse of the book of Acts, we find Jesus saying in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the church established, and Judea and Samaria, the church enlarged, and to the ends of the earth, the church expanded. Paul is part of that church expanded. Now, we have to remember that how we say things really does matter. We find that Paul in his writings, as I said, makes a lot of time engaging in very specific language. And the language that we have is, falls incredibly short of the actual meaning that we can put into an English Bible. For we have been, what? Justified? What? Help me. By faith, through grace. Right? We have been justified by faith through grace. The word justified, we have one little word, and for us, that's a point in time. Boom. It's a dot on a piece of paper. For the Greek mind, and by the way, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Greek mind, the word justified has a whole lot more meaning because of the verb form. Now, we were talking in our you Sabbath school today. English is kind of a dorky language because B-O-W, how do you pronounce that? Or, bow or bow, for the English, how do you pronounce R-O-W? Row or row, a fight, right? We're, our language is just short. All of our Bibles are word short. If you were to try and get the New Testament to convey the entire meaning of every Greek word, it would be this thick and this big, right? So when Paul says we are justified through faith, the word justified is like, Randy, you're going to appreciate this, and I've used this illustration before, it's like someone hitting a golf ball. Right? When you hit the golf ball, we have a little word, right? But that meaning of hitting the golf ball has a whole lot of stuff that's backed up into it. You have the person lining up the shot, working the past, addressing the ball, hello ball, taking the stance, doing the backswing, again, work in the past, the downstroke, work in the past, finally the club face hits the ball and the ball takes off. But the club doesn't stop there, the club continues on, and the ball continues to fly, right? All of that is portrayed when Paul says we are justified. It is God working in the past to a point in time where we accept that through faith by grace, and God continuing to change us and move us into the future. Paul is very intentional in how he uses his word forms. Quick question. Why does he have two names? Changed? Someone said it was changed? Actually, that's a common misconception. The only people in the Bible who had the names changed were Abraham and Sarah. Jacob, I mean Isaac to Israel. Or Jacob to Israel, Jacob to Israel, thank you. Right? Those are the only people who had their, their names changed. Paul was a Roman what? Citizen. Why? His parents. Paul was born in the city of Tarsus which was a free Roman city. Now, when Rome started out, in order to be a citizen of Rome, you had to have been born in Rome. As the empire expanded, Rome granted that free city status to certain very important cities, and Tarsus was an incredibly important city. And being born a citizen carries a lot of clout because you recall 
the centurion saying, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. And Paul says, I was born a citizen. The centurion goes, oh, dang. <laughs> so that has a lot of clout. Paul was his Greek name. Saul was his Hebrew name. And I find it interesting, and probably we most often refer to him as Paul, because Paul's primary, primary group that he focused on was who? The Gentiles, the Greek-speaking population of the world. Well, that's why Paul has two names. But when he's first addressed, what is he known? Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? What do we know about Paul? We know, one, he was standing there when Stephen was being stoned, holding everyone's cloak, saying, yes. We know he went out and hunted down followers of the way to bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished and persecuted. We know he had a conversion experience. He was taught by Jesus. He became a missionary to the Gentiles. He wrote 13 books that we know of. And I say 13 now. Some of you are going to debate with me, and that's fine. I'll, I'll have a great discussion on you. The reason I don't include Hebrews is there is enough linguistic changes in the book of Hebrews that don't match the writings of Paul's other books. That there is a question among scholars about whether or not Paul actually wrote that. It doesn't mean the book of Hebrews is any less valid. It just means we don't necessarily know who the author was. 13 books... He returns to Jerusalem, is made a prisoner, travels to Rome, and is martyred, right? That's what we know about Paul. So I'm going to give you a real quick summary of Paul's travels. I found this wonderful graphic. If you want it, I can email it to you. I broke it down into five or six slides here. We have the conversion experience where tr Paul's traveling to Damascus. From Damascus to Jer Jerusalem to Damascus, about 130 miles. He goes... Then, after this Damascus experience, spends about 300 miles out into the Arabian wilderness and back where he's taught by Jesus. There he travels 130 miles back down to Jerusalem, and from there goes 400 miles off to Tarsus. Last week when Steve was talking, my brain started going, and I started calculating how far Paul would have uh, traveled. On his first missionary journey, he heads up to Antioch, about 150 miles, 130 miles, uh, 300 miles, here we go, 2,300 miles on his first missionary journey, and then finally back down uh, from Antioch down to Jerusalem of 300 miles again. Paul was doing a lot of traveling. And these are hard miles, by the way. These are wagon trip miles. If you've been on a wagon trip and you're not driving a truck, but you're actually walking along, those of you kids who have done that, you know, 2,300 miles is a lot of work. I mean, that's a lot of work, Right? His second missionary journey, he heads back up to Antioch, 300 miles. He goes 2,500 miles, a lot of it by boat on this one, and then heads back to Jerusalem. On his third missionary journey, Paul goes about 3,000 miles. All the while, he's working for himself. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's making tents because he's a tent maker, which is where we get the term tent making ministries, right? And finally... Paul sends, spends about 1,700 miles on his way to Rome. Now, interestingly enough, there is enough extra-biblical evidence to suggest that Paul had a fourth missionary journey that is not included in the book of Acts. And on that fourth missionary journey, uh, he probably went to Spain. Because there's a lot of literature from the early church time in Spain that Paul was there teaching. 2,000 miles round trip back to Rome where Paul is then killed. So Paul gets around 10,000 miles at least, 13,000 miles if you include his fourth missionary journey. That's a lot of hard miles. That's being shipwrecked. <laughs> That's being stoned. That's being beaten, left for dead, right? Now... I have had conversations through the years of people asking why we use we don't use every anything but the King James version of the Bible. Can anyone read this for me please? No? No one? This is Old English. The Old English this is comes from about there they guess somewhere around 1100, 1150 
uh, somewhere around this time. It is one of the most famous pieces of English literature that has survived the years. Anyone? Beowulf. Beowulf. So when people talk about using the authorized version, and I have had people tell me, why don't we use the Bible that Paul wrote? Or Paul used? Well, do you read Hebrew? Because for Paul, the Bible was the Old Testament. Paul did not set out and say, I'm going to write the New Testament. Not, not in a heartbeat. And the authorized version was authorized by who? Somebody? It was authorized by King James, not authorized by God. It was authorized by King James, somewhere around the 1600s. So if you want, here happens to be part of the English translation. I, we, the guardians, in days of yore, the kings, the great kings renowned have heard of. That's what that first page actually reads. Couldn't tell that, right? So when people talk about using the King James as God's Bible and Paul's Bible, this is Old English and we can't even read that. And what we know is modern English or the King James didn't come around for another 1,200 years. So, what do we know about Paul? We have to ask... He was a prolific traveler, a prolific preacher and teacher, a prolific writer, and his writings have changed and shaped the Christian church, including the Seventh-day Adventist church. We have to ask some questions, though. What questions do we have to ask? Why did Paul write? Paul wrote to address specific issues that the church was having at that time. Paul did not set out, as I said earlier, to write a systematic theology of the New Testament and of Christ. As we know from reading 1 Corinthians, they were having some morality problems. When Paul writes the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? When Paul says, absolutely no, the Greek is meganois, which carries the meaning of no, 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 no. What part of no are you not understanding? Is that little Greek phrase, no, meganois. He wrote because he couldn't call, didn't have cell phones, couldn't FaceTime anyone, no Zoom meetings. He wrote because he was in other places addressing other people, but he wanted to address people he loved. Why did Paul write, or what did Paul write? He wrote letters, letters bathed in love and concern, letters of correction, of misunderstanding, or letters of correction of how things had gotten misunderstood through the synchronistic ideas of the popular culture. So when Paul is writing, sometimes he's trying to correct errors from people attacking the church from the outside and people attacking the church from the inside. How did Paul write? Sometimes he writes in his own hand. You can see by the large letters I use. And sometimes Paul uses a dictation. So not unlike um, this guy, Paul is very similar to this guy, Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon was one of the students of Martin Luther who took Martin Luther's writings and systematized them into a theology. Martin Luther did a lot of writing himself. He wrote sermons, he wrote books, he wrote arguments, he wrote treaties. Martin Luther also talked a lot. And Philip was, he'd have these things called table talks. And people began, this is good stuff, and they started taking notes. And one of my favorite books uh, was a book called Table Talks by Martin Luther, a collection of him just talking and people writing down what he says. So Paul used those different methods. What we have here is Paul is used in virtually all of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and virtually all of the fundamental beliefs of 
that we as Christians share. So very quickly, we're going to go through these things. You can see here in the pink highlights, these are the first three of the fundamental Adventist beliefs. The Holy Scriptures, the Trinity, and the Father. Paul is used to justify and defend and categorize our faith in these things. The next, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Again, Paul and Paul. Moving on to creation, Paul. Nature of humanity, Paul. The Great Controversy, Paul. Now, I want you to, if you, if you go online, you can find these, this summary. It's a PDF that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has found. You can find these little summaries. Um, they're actually fairly good. And they have the proof text down there, the, the proof text, right? Don't you like that term? It's one of those Adventist things, right? Um, the, the text down at the bottom th- for how we get those. There is no single writer in all of these things who is used as often as Paul in forming our faith. Experience of salvation, growing in Christ, the church, the remnants and its mission, unity in the body of Christ, baptism, the Lord's Supper, spiritual gift and ministries, the gift of prophecy, the law of God, the Sabbath. Paul does not speak a lot on the Sabbath. We don't use Paul to help justify that aspect of our our faith. Stewardship, Christian behavior, Marriage and family. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And I gave that little caveat on there for Hebrews because Hebrews is definitely used in this uh, concept, but there is question among scholars about whether that was actually written by Paul, so I don't want to include that one. And then we have the second coming, death and resurrection, the millennium, and the new earth. Paul doesn't actually spend a whole lot of time talking about what heaven's going to be like. But Paul helped shape what we think and know. Brennan Manning, those of you who know Brennan Manning, is an amazing individual. He wrote this. The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyles. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Paul helped establish what we would be term the pillars of Adventism, the pillars of Christianity. I've heard a lot through my years of people saying, we need, we need, more, we need more talk about the pillars of Adventism. Just a simple question. What do those pillars uphold? Christ. You take Christ out of any one of those 28 and you have absolutely a house of cards that falls down extremely easy. For Paul, Christ is central. I want to show you this here real quick. These are the 28 fundamentals and you can see here where I've written down what they, uh, the differences that are missing the Sabbath, Christ and his ministry, and the new earth. Here we go. Paul wrote several books. We're going to go through these real quickly. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. He probably wrote them in this order. The Thessalonians, Galatians, then the Corinthians, then Romans, then Colossians, then Ephesians, Philippians, Timothy. There's some debate on Timothy and Titus. And the last book he probably wrote was Philemon. Interestingly enough, we find that Philemon, uh, do you remember the servant's name? Onesimus, thank you very much. Early church writings refer to the bishop of Antioch as Onesimus, and the church, early church historians believe that the Onesimus of the bishop of Antioch was the slave in Philemon who became a church leader. Pretty cool stuff. There we go. So, where's that slide? I just put, here it is. This is the one I wanted this. For Paul, Christ is central. Notice the highlighted in yellow here. In him, through him, for him, he is, in him, he is, he is, he might have supremacy in him, through him. 
We're going to read through this real quickly. Let me get to it here. The Son is the image of the living, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created. Our doctrine of creation... Things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether those, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things the doctrine of God and the eternalness of God. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the church, the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that everything in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all things, all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Do you know how many doctrines are in this one little phrase? For Paul, it was all about that. So when we have people talk about the pillars. The pillars only uphold one thing. Through my years, I have had people tell me these things. How come we're not talking about our distinctive Adventist beliefs? Which ones? Well, you know, the distinctive Adventist beliefs. Well, which ones? Well, you know, the things that we believe. (laughs) There is nothing more central to anything that we believe than Jesus. There is nothing more central to anything we believe than Jesus. Pastor Steve, when he... It's hard to, to write a sermon on the life of Paul, right? When he left his message last night, he used this quote. Paul was focusing on what was happening in him, not to him. Likewise, we can be sure that when something is happening to us, God is going to do something in us, something that will shape us for eternity. The life of Paul a focus on faith and grace from a man who persecuted the church and brought people to Jerusalem to be killed. Paul, a man who had no question, no doubt that he was saved by grace through faith. When Steve was closing off last week, because Steve and I have been talking about Acts and all this, I'm thinking, Steve, you little turd. You're taking my thunder on Paul. Giving these quotes. But he didn't use any of my texts, so we're good. I'm going to do the same thing that Steve did, though. He got the idea from me. I'm just saying, Steve, I'm calling you out on that one. Romans 3, 23 and 4. We as Seventh-day Adventists love verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we stop there. Why? That's not the entire thought. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Romans 8. For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Yeah. Romans. 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in views of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and pro- proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Galatians 5 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Dig this that we may have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Paul does not say, I pray that you become a vegetarian. Paul does not say, I pray that on the Sabbath you don't get anything above your ankles wet in the water. Paul prays for us in this, that we may have the power to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the what? The love of Christ. This is the pillar of Adventism. Christ is the pillar of the Christian church. Philippians, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Do we sing songs about that? Jesus, name above all names. Do we sing songs about the 2300 days? Do we sing songs about the nature of death? not unless it's attached to the victory of eternal life. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Colossians, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. As God's chosen people we get to put on his uniform and his uniform is compassion kindness, humility gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on What? Love, which binds them all together in unity. In Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is stored up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but all those who have longed for his appearing. Listen. Listen. And I will tell you a mystery. (laughs) We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that was written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of sin, of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But what? Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord and Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. This is a pillar of Adventism. This is a pillar of Christianity. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. For Paul, there was one pillar on which all of his faith rested. And that was the pillar of the cross. Christ crucified. Christ risen. And the change that God brought in his life and he promises to us. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose.
as we look at the life of Paul, as we look at the book of Acts, we see a man who gave everything, who believed that nothing happened to him that somehow God wasn't in control of, and had the faith to say, once again, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his promise. Father, bless us as we seek your voice and we stand on the pillar of faith, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, Thank you.